Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Asia House. I'm Michael Lawrence. This evening, we are pleased to be presenting a lecture by Lord Stephen Green, the Chairman of Asia House, titled The Open Futures of the Middle East. Tonight's lecture marks the public launch of the Asia House Middle East program, the aim of which is to drive European and Asian engagement with the Middle East. The Asia House Middle East program will focus on trade and investment. And this will be the core theme at our first conference in the region, which will take place in a little under two weeks, April 22 in Dubai. Now, one focus of the Middle East program will be the Belt and Road Initiative, the flows it will underpin between the Middle East and Asia, and the opportunities this will create. More on Belt and Road, no doubt, when Stephen speaks in just a moment. Asia House is uniquely placed to produce an ongoing Middle East program. We are an independent and objective organization with a global network of corporate clients and supporters and strong relationships with governments and policy makers. And as part of our drive to engage with the Middle East, we have undertaken a piece of research titled The Middle East's Asian Pivot. Uh, it will be released formally tomorrow, but if you're interested in seeing a, an executive summary, we have some available this evening. Uh, some of the findings, it, it's found that Asia's trade with the Middle East has risen significantly over the last decade, while numbers from Western economies have declined very sharply. The report indicates that this trend is likely to continue, driven in part by Asia's increasing energy demands, the Middle East's growing appetite for consumer goods, the Vision 2030 program, the very ambitious program out of Saudi Arabia, and opportunities which will emerge along the Belt and Road. The research will be released tomorrow, as I said. You can get a copy of the executive summary and have a look on the website for the full thing. But now, to speak on the open futures of the Middle East, please welcome to the podium, Lord Stephen Green. Michael, thank you very much for those kind words of introduction, and it's always a pleasure to be Back at Asia House, I have the honor of being the chair here, and there are some very exciting things happening at Asia House, not least uh, the launch of our Middle East program, and it's that that uh, forms the background to what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, Your Royal Highness, it's a great uh, privilege to have you here. Uh, the kingdom is, of course, a central part of the Middle East, and I've got a few words to say about, uh, about the kingdom and its... Uh, exciting journey uh, in a few minutes, but I wanted personally to welcome you here. Um, we've, we've, our paths last crossed a, f a few years back, actually, when I was uh, in, uh, in gainful employment, um, <laughs> and it's now a pleasure to welcome you he uh, here. Um, and congratulations, if I may say so publicly, on the remarkable success of the Crown Prince's visit recently. I know, Ambassador, how much work that gives you to do, uh, both uh, in preparation and, of course, in follow-up, because there are many uh, exciting respects in which uh, relationships with the Kingdom, and indeed more broadly in the Middle East, are going to grow rapidly in the years to come. But let me uh, um, take you through a, a perspective on the Middle East, which I titled The Open Futures, and I deliberately used the word uh, futures in the plural, uh, of the Middle East. Uh, I used the word plural in the plural because too often, I think, in this part of the world, Western Europe, uh, North America, um, we tend to treat the Middle East as one homogenous uh, part of the world, and whereas, of course, anybody who knows anything uh, much about the region will realize that it's very differentiated, um, that the, the differences within the region are extremely important. And I want to dwell a little on those. We're launching our new Middle East program as part of our mission to support business engagement throughout Asia. And we've been determined that Asia House means what it says, uh, i.e. we're not just focused on East Asia, um, we are focused on Asia, uh, and this includes South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, the Middle East. This is all part of this extraordinarily exciting, rapidly changing, and huge continent uh, just to the east of Europe. We do believe, therefore, that Asia will be the linchpin of a new global trading order in the 21st century. 
as rapidly increasing connectivity from east to west and from north to south brings massive new opportunities, but of course also increasing geopolitical complexity. Within this broader context, the Middle East has got its own dynamics, which are simultaneously both deeply rooted and fast-changing. Any business, and we are here to serve the business community, any business which is aiming to participate profitably and sustainably in these parts of the world needs to take a long-term perspective and to understand the deeper influences which shape society, geopolitics, and the course of economic development. The Middle East is usually classified statistically um, as the countries of the Middle East plus those of North Africa in a single region which is called MENA, M-E-N-A, Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the re that statistical region uh, includes 22 sovereign states. It has a total population of 380 million people, about 6% of the world's total. It has over half of the world's oil reserves and nearly half of the world's gas reserves. It includes 8 out of 12 OPEC members. And of course, as we all know, hydrocarbons have dominated the region's geopolitics for probably the last 100 years. Those economies in the region, which are bountifully endowed with hydrocarbons, have seen dramatic transformation for the most part over the last century, or last half century anyway. The others have remained much poorer. And few of them, with or without oil, have succeeded yet in developing a modern, broad-based economy capable of providing enough good employment opportunities for a rapidly growing and youthful population. Few of them have yet demonstrated real competitiveness internationally. Non-oil exports, non exports from the entire region total less than the exports of Belgium. And collectively, the region lags behind the OECD in terms of higher education and investment in research and development. So as we all know, there are plenty of challenges. The image of the Middle East in the Western mind is too often of countries caught in a politically and socially conservative time warp. The fragility of the new Iraq, the perceived failure of the Arab Spring everywhere except perhaps in Tunisia, the impenetrable obscurity of Iran's polity, the fragmentation of Libya, and the seemingly unending tragedy of Syria yet again in the headlines just these last few days. All of this has reinforced a perception that the region remains immune to political modernization. Meanwhile, social attitudes, perhaps especially in respect to the role of women, seem to belong to a previous era. The relative modernism and international openness of some of the Gulf states is seen as an exception which appears to prove a rule. And yet, change is afoot. Even if it will take longer than the timetables of a busy world typically allow for. There is a distant echo of this in the Europe of the 19th century. The fact that the revolutions in Europe in 1848 failed did not mean that nothing was changing. The truth then was that the social structure was being transformed below the surface, slowly but surely, by urbanization and by industrialization. And that this would sooner or later force open the way societies were governed. The fundaments of the 20th century were being laid in the 19th, whether or not the elites and the literati of the time recognized this. Urbanization and connectivity will just as surely change the Middle East in the coming decades. The urbanization story is as dramatic as anywhere in the world. The percentage of the population of the region living in cities has risen from 35% in 1960 to 65% now and is still increasing rapidly. In fact, at a rate faster than anywhere else in the world except Sub-Saharan Africa. It'll certainly reach the OECD norm of around 75 to 80% within the next two or three decades. 
And speaking as one who, I was saying this to the ambassador just now, first went to Riyadh in 1979, at a time when it was one-tenth as large as it is now, and when the infrastructure was, to say the least, primitive, I can testify from my own memories and experience what a dramatic transformation has already taken place. Connectivity is the other side of this coin. It, too, is increasing fast, as evidenced on many dimensions, telecommunications, transport, travel, trade flows, all tell the same story. The speed of the change has, in some important respects, been slower than other parts of the world. Thus, for example, mobile connectivity may have grown significantly from a standing start in the last three decades, but the pace of the expansion has been slower and penetration rates are lower outside of the prosperous uh, peninsula and Gulf states. But as important as the growth in connectivity by any such external measures is the intellectual transformation brought about by urbanization. There remain enormous challenges, of course. The weakness of the literary culture in Arabic, for example. 5% of the world's population produces only 1% of the world's books. But slowly, urbanization is spreading education, and that is bringing about change. All children, and especially girls, are much more likely to get at least some education if they live in urban areas than those um, uh, live in urban societies, I should say, um, as compared with their grandparents' experience. And education creates connections with the wider world. Literacy rates have doubled from around 40% in 1990, not so very long ago, to over 80% now. Primary schooling for both boys and girls is all but universal. And secondary schooling has been substantially extended. This achievement is all the more significant given the rapid expansion in the numbers of children at a rate faster than anywhere else in the world, again, except sub-Saharan Africa. But there is a long journey ahead, of course. The World Bank has produced data which show that there are substantial quality deficiencies, evidenced, for example, by weak performance against international be benchmarks in mathematics. Hence, the intellectual capital in the Middle East remains behind other parts of Asia. The six Arab Human Development Reports produced by the United Nations between the year 2002 and 2016, reports produced by Arabs looking critically at their own societies, are a comprehensive analysis of the complex and interrelated challenges on the road ahead, covering everything from education through the status of women to the problem of youth unemployment. But the change is real, and its impact over the next generation or two will be profound. The individual creative energy that this generates will gradually be felt in the burgeoning of human lives in a way that their grandparents could barely have dreamed of, and which will challenge the constraints of tradition. In all of these ways, the direction of travel is clear and is surely impossible to reverse. These newly urbanized and better educated societies are now engaging more broadly with the wider world. And indeed, there is a profound shift taking place. For two centuries, from Napoleon's expedition to Egypt in 1798 onwards, the region increasingly caught the attention of Europeans who were animated by a mixture of commercial, cultural, strategic, and military motives. European poets and artists became fascinated by the culture of Islam. Their archaeologists explored the ancient sites of Egypt, Persia, and Mesopotamia, and they discovered the oil beneath the sand. The politics of oil and the strategic rivalries of the European powers bedeviled the region, 
until well into the post-war period. The history of British, French, American, and Russian activity gives ample cause for shame. Tensions continue, but the key point is that the relationship is no longer a one-sided affair. Because apart from anything else, the region has found that others, not just its old colonial bullies, have an interest in what it can offer. And so its connections with the rest of Asia are now growing fast. Its geopolitical relationships are becoming more diverse, more balanced. The visible presence of Japanese, Korean, and now Chinese entrepreneurs and businesses of one sort or another is the clearest sign of the change. So is the changing pattern of Middle Eastern trade to which Michael has already alluded and which we've done a bit of homework on. Oil exports to the rest of Asia have, of course, risen rapidly as East Asian economies have developed over the last generation. That's no surprise to any of us. But it's also striking that non-oil exports from the Middle East have diversified sharply in the direction of Asia too. 20 years ago, almost 60% of those exports went to the European Union. That has dropped to less than 40%, whilst the Asian share has risen from a 20% then to well over 35% now. The trend continues away from over-reliance on traditional markets towards newer relationships that are more balanced and, by the way, don't carry the same historical baggage. Historical baggage, history matters. And not just the collective memory of subservience to the Europeans, for the Middle East is, of course, not just a collection of countries with a common geography. This is a region which has a profound sense of common identity, defined by its history. And that is in no way diminished by the impact of urbanization and increasing connectivity. Just as the ocean, deep, remains unmoved by the storms which may boil on the surface, so this common consciousness underlies and is undisturbed by all of the rivalries and even internecine strife which the world sees as sometimes tearing the region apart. The vast majority of the population of the region are, of course, Muslim. And part of the bedrock of their consciousness is membership of the Ummah, the Commonwealth of Believers. Their shared folk memory is of an empire which at its height stretched across the whole of the present-day MENA region and well beyond into Spain in one direction and into Central Asia all the way to the gates of China in the other. At the height of its power, it controlled the trade routes between the East and West. It presided over a fertile exchange of ideas between China, Europe, Iran, and India, and Arabia, which resulted in astonishing advances in such fields as philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and architecture. And it produced, as an aside almost, some of the greatest poetic literature that the world has ever known. It was, in fact, one of the most glorious periods in the whole of human history. Sharing that same deep Muslim cultural heritage, though not normally included in the MENA region for statistical purposes, are two other countries that are geographically connected to the region, Turkey and Pakistan. Their peoples, too, are part of the Ummah. And as a result, the history of each, albeit in very different ways, has tied them closely to the region. And those ties are now becoming stronger. Which means that the Middle East needs to be viewed strategically from this broader perspective. With those two countries included, the total population of the region is around three-quarters of a billion people, around 10% of the world's total. The religious bonds of the Ummah give the region a unifying culture whose power is underpinned by the spread of the Arabic language. As the language of the Quran, Arabic has a sacred significance 
that is hard for those with a cultural hinterland in, say, Christendom or Confucianism to really appreciate. For Muslims, no education is complete without the study of the Quran in its original Arabic. The role of Latin in European culture up until the 18th century is a misleading parallel. In fact, it's not really a parallel. It comes nowhere near to conveying the depth of the emotional and spiritual commitment throughout the Ummah to Arabic as a language. For no Muslim is Arabic just another language indeed. It is an inalienable part of the fabric of their consciousness. Avicenna, the great Muslim philosopher of the 11th century, whose impact on the whole of European medieval thought is almost impossible to overstate, was an Iranian, and he wrote mostly in Persian. But he, like all the other great writers of that extraordinary era, spoke Arabic as, as it were, a second mother tongue. Indeed, it is said that he could recite the entire Quran in Arabic from the age of 10. To this day, Arabic in one form or another is spoken across most of the MENA region, with the significant exception of Iran, uh, which I'm going to return to. At a global level, Arabic is the fifth most widely spoken mother tongue. If you treat the entire Arabic, uh, the variants of Arabic across the whole region as one, one single language, it's the fifth most widely spoken but its influence is much more pervasive even than that statistic implies. Nevertheless, language highlights differences as well as commonalities. There are three major region, countries in that wider region that I've described which do not have Arabic as their mother tongue. Iran, of course, and Turkey and Pakistan. It's no coincidence that all these three have distinctive personas, histories, and strategic priorities. So, arguably, does Egypt. Even though its own native language succumbed long ago to Arabic, the Arabic of its conquerors, uh, such that it is now only used in the liturgy of its Coptic Christian churches, there are, therefore, in effect, five major entities within the region though all part of the Ummah, which differentially impact regional geopolitics and economic developments. And I want to spend just a few minutes on each of those five. There is, firstly, the world of the Arabian Peninsula, largely Saudi Arabia, of course. Largely Sunni, historically very conservative in the Wahhabi heartlands in the center, more connected and more open on the Red Sea and Gulf coasts. This is, of course, the heartland of Islam, at the center of which lies Mecca. It is not for nothing that the, kingdom of, the king of Saudi Arabia is described as the custodian of the two holy mosques. Yet oil has transformed these communities irrevocably. And the reforms of the present Saudi government represent, perhaps for the first time, an effort to begin to break loose from a Wahhabi set of constraints and to allow society to enjoy some of the implications of modernity, as well as to pursue a regional strategy that befits its economic weight. Meanwhile, an ambitious strategy of economic reform aims as we all know, to achieve a listing of the country's most important economic asset, Aramco, an economic liberalization across a wide range of sectors. This is nothing if not an ambitious and challenging program of change in a remarkable part of the world. It is too early, obviously, to say how much of all this will be successfully implemented and bedded down. But the truth is that even partial success would amount to radical development. It would result in Saudi Arabia becoming a more modern society and a more normal geopolitical actor with regional implications. Then there is Saudi Arabia's great rival for spiritual authority in the region, Iran. 
This is a country which never forgets its glorious past. Whether it is the legacy of Darius or of Shah Abbas, that past is alive in the present. This non-Arabic speaking Shiite citadel was never just another Muslim country, either before or after 1979. Iranians produced some of the greatest glories of that Islamic golden era from the 9th century onwards, in some ways more so than any other parts of the Ummah. The two greatest thinkers of medieval Islam, Avicenna, whom I've already referred to, and Al-Ghazali, were both Iranians. The Iranian national epic, the Shahnameh, was composed by an Islamic scholar to celebrate the colorful myths of the pre-Islamic past and is taught in all Iranian schools. In fact, the imprint of that past is everywhere. The most important festival in the Iranian calendar is Nowruz, a celebration of the vernal equinox, which goes all the way back to Zoroastrian times. The taxi drivers of Tehran, I'm told, can recite verses from Rumi and Hafez, two of the greatest poets of any culture. Iran's relations with all of its neighbors, as well as with the West and with Russia, are fraught with tensions and misunderstandings. Sanctions have cramped the performance of an economy which remains bedeviled by vested interests and massive corruption. It should be richer than Turkey, whose population is about the same size, but its economy is in fact only half as large. It should be richer because, of course, it's much more richly endowed with those hydrocarbon resources. The Turkey's got none of them. An opaque interplay between theology and financial interests lies between, behind a struggle between modernizers and conservatives, which is not over yet. So Iran's future on the Eurasian stage remains unclear. Iran remains, remains resource-rich and is possibly possibly the best educated country in the region. It also has much of the capability needed to nuclearize itself. Iran and Saudi Arabia watch each other warily. Egypt, the largest country in the region, the largest Arab country. Like Iran, but for quite different reasons, it too feels that it has a special heritage. Though its pharaonic past is now a matter for museums and tourism, it's not forgotten. And it leaves Egyptians with a residual sense of ancient dignity. They may have surrendered their language, unlike Iran, but for centuries, both before and after Islam, Egypt was ruled by outsiders. From a very early stage, though, those Egyptian rulers have asserted a high degree of autonomy within the Ummah. It was the Mamluk rulers of Egypt, Turks, who finally stopped the Mongols from overwhelming the whole of the Muslim world at the Battle of Angelut in 1260. It was Cairo that became the intellectual and theological center of Sunni Islam and retained this mantle even under the Ottomans from the 16th century onwards. Egypt wrested control of its own affairs from the Ottomans long before the Peninsular Arabians did. And it was Egypt which finally humiliated the British and the French during the Suez Crisis. But it has never managed to establish a stable and functioning democracy. Nowhere else, perhaps, were the hopes for the Arab Spring fresher. Nowhere else were they strangled so completely. First by the breathtakingly blinkered leadership of a newly elected Islamist government, and then by the return of a military that proceeded to govern in the only way it knew, and as it had done for much of the post-war period. So the lid is now firmly back on the kettle, and the question is whether economic growth can give enough people a stake in stability quickly enough to prevent the next explosion. Meanwhile, the economic signals are mixed. Reforms 
strengthened the, the country's precarious financial position and somewhat liberalized the country um, of, a, of the economy of a country stultified by nationalization, bureaucracy, and corruption. Economic growth looks high compared with some of its regional analogues, but it's in the middle of the pack internationally, and the combination of high demographic growth, high poverty, and high unemployment, especially amongst the young, makes for a dangerous cocktail. Turkey faces, of course, both into and outwards from the region. It is the only Muslim country in the world with a large, diversified, sophisticated, and open economy. It is the largest economy in the region, by some margin. Apart from the oil-based economies of the Gulf, it is much the most prosperous Muslim state in the world and appeared in the last century to be on a journey of secularization and on a journey taking it towards membership of the European Union. Its imperial links to the region have been cut politically and psychologically. Some of this, of course, is now being reversed under Erdogan. The cultural bonds are being re-emphasized, whilst the journey to, to, to Europe seems to have hit the buffers. Its orientation is shifting. But the outcome remains unclear. Erdogan talks up the country's Sunni Muslim commitment, and no Turk will ever forget the caliphate, which was the centerpiece of the Ottoman Empire until the early 20th century. The outcome of the struggle between secularism and assertive religiousness is not yet clear. Not even Erdogan has yet felt able to remove the image of Atatürk from public life. But one thing is clear. The image, uh, the, the assertive Turkish nationalism, together with regular references to past Ottoman glories, which you do hear now, make for uncomfortable relationships within the region uh, because it hasn't forgotten the Ottomans either. Turkey, because of that imperial past, will, I suggest, always find it difficult to assert a leadership role within the region. Meanwhile, and finally amongst I, my five major uh, entities within the region, at the eastern end is Pakistan a country which has from the first been on a journey away from its Indian heritage. Despite, ironically, the presence in Pakistan of famous archaeological sites which were in fact the center of the oldest Indian civilization. The loss of its Bengali East when Bangladesh was born in 1971 left Pakistan with an orientation which is predominantly focused westwards and northwards and which taps into a long history of Islamic power in the region, extending back through ups and downs to the Umayyads of the 8th century. Muhammad Ali Jinnah envisaged a state for Muslim Indians which would be liberalizing, democratic and modern. He died too soon to see its descent into a tussle between political venality and military domination and a plague of religious extremism. The standoff in Kashmir and the obsession with the Indian enemy has poisoned public life there for essentially since its founding years. And yet the economy did quite well, at least in its first decades, better in fact than India as a result of its relatively liberal, unregimented economic policies. But in the last two decades, it has fallen well behind, as India has in turn opened up and as security has deteriorated in Pakistan. So the country remains one which is well-educated, as far as the elite is concerned, but where that elite is fractured and fractious, and battles with a well-entrenched military for leadership of what is otherwise a poor and badly educated majority. However, though Pakistan is not blessed with hydrocarbons, its geographic location also means that it finds itself on the route 
of one of the most strategically important spurs of China's Great Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road Initiative is the cornerstone of Chinese foreign policy. And at Asia House, we have regularly talked about its significance, both in trade and in geopolitics. And typically, the tendency is to think about it as mainly an east-west linkage uh, with connecting up at one end, China, of course, and at the other end, the prosperous markets of Europe. The Belt and Road Initiative is more than that. And it has got at least two important spurs that don't run east-west, they run north-south. One, uh, uh, still a plan, um, from Kunming down through Southeast Asia towards Singapore, and another which is not just a plan, it is being implemented down from Central Asia through Pakistan to the Persian Gulf at the new port of Gwadar. Huge investments in energy, and in transport systems are beginning to connect Pakistan internally and with Central Asia and China. The geopolitical significance of this is not lost on any of Pakistan's neighbors, either to the west in the Middle East or, of course, to the east in India. Over the coming decades, that new Chinese policy orientation with the Belt and Road Initiative as its cornerstone will transform not just Central Asia, but actually the Middle East too, not only Pakistan. The dramatic increase in physical connectivity across the whole of Eurasia will unleash, not overnight, not even over the next five years, beyond the normal planning horizons, but in the sorts of time frames the Chinese are used to thinking of, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, economic development, investment, and trade on a historic scale. On a scale at least significant, uh, uh, significance at least equal to the great opening which the railways, steamships, and international capital markets brought to the Europe and North America of the 19th century. All this will draw the Middle East further into Eurasian trade and investment connections. And the evolution of stable societies and polities in the region will be of ever greater concern, not just to the West, but to Asians as well. The future, or as I prefer to use the word futures, of the Middle East are now matters of vital interest to all the great powers of Asia. China's new military base in Djibouti is the latest, the first overseas military base of the People's Republic in Djibouti. It sort of tells you all you need to know. It's the latest illustration, both of its, both of its China's new geopolitical role and of the geopolitical significance that it attaches to the Middle East. Those futures for the Middle East remain open. The geopolitical risks are obvious. Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia all have some problematic relations around their borders to deal with. All have found it impossible to establish normal relations with Israel, a country which I otherwise haven't mentioned. Pakistan lives with its endless hostility towards India. Turkey has its ambivalence about Europe. So the tensions are ramified, of course. But the underlying trend underneath all of that is of rising education and awareness, which will, over time, bring about a slow-burning revolution of modernity. That revolution will have to continue to contend with other impulses. Some will listen to Islamist claims to represent the authentic voice of Islam. Others will succumb to nationalist fervor. All those voices will seek to use the connectivity of the social media. But for all of the dangerous byways they may have opened up, the social media will largely be a great highway of modernization. The virtual accompaniment, if you will, to the roads railways, shipping lanes, and air routes that are connecting the region to the rest of the continent. 
The implications for business strategy are clear. Engagement is surely the order of the day. There will be plenty of bumps and wrong turnings on the road, no doubt. But the prize is there for all those with the sort of long-term perspective that the Chinese and the Japanese and the Koreans all bring to the region. And successful engagement is a sensitive engagement which recognizes the rich glory of the Islamic heritage and achievement in human history, which recognizes the sins of the imperial past, and which sees the importance of the role of business in contributing to an open society, as well as, of course, being realistic about the commercial risks and rewards of investment. So the futures are open. They may well be varied, hence the use of the plural, but they're exciting. This is a rapidly growing part of the world uh, which has many of the resources that any modern economy needs in profusion. It has so much to offer in terms of its people and its resources. It is getting better and better connected. And hence, from our perspective in Asia House, we believe it's very important that we launch this new Asia program, Middle East program, in the context of our role as a bridge builder for Asia and Europe. Thank you very much, everybody. <clears throat>